Good to see everybody up on the screen. I wish we could, we were meeting in person, but that seems like uh, we need to carry on uh, through the COVID environment being uh, on Zoom meetings. So I think I can see everybody from uh, the other end of the table. So welcome. I will call this uh, Abbotsford Police Board regular meeting for January 26th to order. And the first item that we have is the introduction of a new uh, police board member, Colette Squires. Uh, she's down, well, she's down on the bottom of my screen, but I don't know where she is on yours, but uh, there she's waving. Good, I can see that. Um, Colette uh, has been appointed to the uh, board, uh, the order of the Lieutenant Governor and Council uh, that was approved on December 24, 2021. And she's appointed for one year, so her term ending uh, December 31st, 2022. And for Colette's benefit, that is not unusual. Uh, most of the new board members are appointed for a year. And then usually on a renewal, uh, it comes with a two-year term. Uh, I don't know that there's any three-year terms that I've seen in my time as mayor. But so uh, don't let that discourage you in any way. That's just the way the system works. And they send me letters before that, uh, just advising me of that. We do have a couple, of, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Colette, uh, maybe uh, if you can uh, just tell the board uh, and the staff that are on the call a little bit about yourself. Um, and uh, I could do some of that, I think, but I may say things that uh, you would not have said and omit things that you would have liked me to say. So anyways, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and uh, if you can do that in, uh, in a few minutes. Yeah. That's great, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Braun, and it's a pleasure to be joining all of you. And uh, just a few um, words of introduction about myself. I have a, a fairly long-standing connection with the Abbotsford Police Department. I was the Executive Director for Abbotsford Restorative Justice, their first, actually first paid Executive Director and had the privilege of being able to help design those programs for community, for neighborhood disputes, police files, develop the schools program, the mentoring program. And that during the, that was between 03 and 09. And at that time I took training at the Justice Institute of BC to widen my skills from being a victim offender mediator to be able to practice mediation more broadly. In 2010, I, um, I had left uh, Abbotsford Restorative Justice. I started my master's degree at UFV in criminal justice, and I launched my private practice. And so Colette Squires and Associates was launched then. And so I do um, kind of two aspects in my, in my work there. Part of it is mediation, conflict resolution, uh, helping organizations respond to things like sometimes grievances and investigations and harassment, things like that lead to um, the need to help facilitate people being able to work together again after that or work together more effectively. I've done a lot of training, um, leadership, coaching and mentoring and communication and skills trainings in that organizational setting. And for um, so that's for government as well as not for profits and business, but also families. I've had a number of families that have called me, so I've been able to help them, which is great. And then there's the, um, the other side of my shop where I'm a, an instructor at the Justice Institute of BC in the Center for Leadership and Conflict Resolution. And I also teach criminal justice and criminology at Trinity Western University. And I deliver training as a uh, guest speaker in a number of different settings. I've done a lot of that in the school system. And I help organizations design and evaluate their programs through an evidence-based approach. And that's very, very important to me. And some of the things that I'll be looking at too, as we think about how to make positive changes for the community in Abbotsford. So, um, so I do a lot of different things, but with a lot of touch points in the field of public safety, criminal justice, uh, and very, very passionate about collaboration between community partners and how police work together to create thriving communities with high degrees of well-being and um, and a sense of mutual regard and mutual respect. So. Very happy to be here to be able to support those kinds of things. And just wondering if I'm audible, if my mic is working well, thumbs up if you heard me okay. Is that, uh, people got it, thank you. That's great. Anyway, thank you, Mayor, for that moment to introduce myself. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll maybe have uh, the existing, or the rest of the board, uh, just give a brief uh, 
uh, introduction. I'm not sure you know all of them. Uh, just uh, who you are, what what you're uh, what you're all about, and uh, how long you've been on the board. So I I will just start in the order that uh, I've got it. Uh, Mark is oh, sorry. Mark and Paula. Ola, although I think Paula, Paula just joined. joined. Uh, I was going to say Mark and Paula were both going to be just a little bit late, so I'll leave Mark to the end. Uh, so Paula, why don't I start with you? Hi, everyone. Sorry I was late. Uh, I was in, doing another workshop till noon, so um, glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm not exactly, I missed, I missed the introduction. So yes, I'm Paula, I'm on the boards. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, are you on? I think you are. I thought I saw your, up yep, top. up on top. Hi there. Welcome, Colette. I am a new uh, board member as well. I've just started my term um, in June and um, I am involved in the community with um, the medical field. I also have a background in restorative justice uh, mediation. Um, I look forward to working with you and quite excited about your statement about working um, with partners in the community. So welcome and uh, happy new year to everybody. Hello, nice to see you all. Yes, likewise. Uh, Mike, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Welty, and I've been on the board for just over five years. I'm on the tail end of my uh, six-year term, and currently I'm the chair of the Finance Committee and involved with uh, collective bargaining on the, uh, for the police uh, union. Other than that, I've um, been a long-time Abbotsford resident, uh, born and raised here, and uh, work in manufacturing at this point in my career. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Mayor Braun. Uh, Colette, welcome. Uh, I'm Chris Dominato, uh, currently CFO for a family business out in Chilliwack. Uh, live in Abbotsford uh, with my family. I've been on the board for four years now, um, coming to the end of my current term. Uh, I sit on the Finance Committee with Mike Welty um, and have just recently joined the HR Committee. Good, and I don't think Mark is on yet, at least I don't see his name. So we'll leave that for uh, later on in this meeting or if he doesn't join till after the, uh, or after the open meeting or the open meeting is ended, we'll do it in close. So, so thank you uh, everyone <clears throat> for those comments. Um, the next item that's before us is the consent agenda. And um, Colette, I should have explained this when we had breakfast the other day and I forgot. Uh, the consent agenda is uh, published. Uh, if there's any questions on any of those items, A through uh, G, then uh, somebody would make a motion or ask to have that removed so we can discuss it. Otherwise, we have a motion to receive all of that information in one motion. So if there's any questions on any of this, uh, that's for the whole board. Uh, please let me know, otherwise a motion uh, would be in order. I'll move it. Okay, uh, moved by Mike, seconded by Chris. I see that hand, a little dark background. I gotta look a little, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm so far at the end of their end of this table. I should pull this one out and move a little bit closer, but I, if I miss your hand, uh, don't take it personally. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, motion carries. Uh, that takes us to business arising out of the previous minutes. And uh, there is one item for the police board awards. Uh, I forget who asked this, but uh, put it on the agenda. Uh, I, I can speak to Chief. you, sir. Yep. Uh, so Chris uh, Dominato, you brought up a question about why our awards, the officer police board awards, uh, did not apply to some of the smaller private schools, Christian schools. Uh, so we did follow up on that, and uh, what was determined was that uh, um, the number of graduates each year is too low of a threshold for those schools. Uh, Donna also reached out to the schools as well and determined from them uh, that they do have a lot of other awards, and, and so they weren't uh, too concerned about it either. Um, but they were thankful for you know us reaching out and, and asking that question. But the main reason was is that um, at this point, just the number of graduates they have is incredibly low. A small group of schools. So, 
I hope that answers your question, uh, Chris. Yes, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, that takes us then to presentations, uh, 2021 year end review. Over to the chief. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate the time. So I just thought it would be a good time. We, uh, we missed everybody in November. And of course, you know, it was a, a very busy time. But uh, I just want to go over the year in review because 2021 was, uh, was one heck of a year for Abbotsford. And I'm incredibly proud of uh, the department. So uh, over and above everything, as you know, um, just to keep in mind, you know, throughout 2021, we dealt with COVID, we dealt with the heat dome. Uh, of course, none of us will ever forget the floods. And uh, also we're still dealing with the opioid crisis, which is impacting our community significantly. So, so many things we were challenged with. I just want to thank, before I start, uh, Inspector uh, Tom Chesley from the Investigative Support Branch, who's on this call, uh, and Sergeant Mike Hannonen, who's new to the Intel section there. Um, for just uh, putting this together. Uh, they put this data together all, uh, you know, on a weekly basis for our staff so that we can do intelligence-led policing and, and really focus on, on what's important for our department. Can you use the arrows up? The and I'm one. just, this yeah. one? Yeah. Okay, just getting the lesson here. So I'll start off with uh, just calls for service and just to really uh, show everybody here just how incredibly busy uh, we were last year despite everything that was going on. As you can see, our calls for service went up, uh, over 5,000 calls. Um, and uh, it just speaks to I me. Mean, we're talking about almost over 150 calls every day that we deal on average uh, has a service. Uh, so it has put a strain on our resourcing um, and being able to manage you know, priority calls. But again, uh, the team is doing a great job. I think what I also wanna highlight here is in red, you'll see just over 1,000, almost 1,100 uh, online reporting calls. And that's something we really dedicated ourselves to, uh, and congratulations and kudos to Director Elaine Klassen, uh, who's really worked hard, and Paul Walker, our new media person. for getting the message out. But, um, We'll talk a little bit more about Ecom later, but it's well documented, the challenges that they're facing, the amount of drop calls uh, for persons who uh, are just tired of waiting for the more minor complaints. Um, so directing people to the online platform so that we're aware of the crime that's occurring in our city and we can actually utilize that information to identify hotspots and target areas that we know are problematic. So that will be a real priority for us moving ahead in 2022 is to continue to see that number in red go up significantly so that we get a, a true reflection of what's occurring. But this is just to show you that, uh, that really we're seeing uh, you know, a steady increase in the calls for service in our Street checks is, is something there's been a lot of discussion about over the, over the last couple of years. As you know, it was mandated by police services, uh, uh, new mandates on how street checks are conducted. Um, as we talked about, quite a bit of concern about whether that would impact crime uh, and our ability to manage crime. You'll see shortly that it really hasn't for the most part. Uh, so we only last year had 10 street checks. Um, and we're very mindful of, of the impacts these types of checks can have on, you know, certainly a racial, racialized, a marginalized community. Um, but we also know that uh, connecting with our community, talking to people out in the street is important. So um, I just want to reflect that uh, this is a change. As police board members, you certainly uh, will probably have much conversation about this with other board members from other communities. So, and please feel free uh, if you have questions as we're going along, or get them at the end. Just want to talk about uh, homicides. Uh, once again, uh, you know, we did see an increase by two from the year previous. Uh, what I think is important to note and, and something that I think all of us here, the management team that's, uh, that's on the call, we're all very proud of the fact that we've been able to really do a lot of effort to address and disrupt um, the gang violence and, and uh, the homicides that are directly connected to the Lower Mainland Gang Complex. So last year, none of these uh, homicides that we had, despite four being, you know, obviously very sad for our community, none were directly related to the Lower Mainland Gang Complex. And that's a kudos again to Inspector Bennett's team, uh, Inspector Doug Moore, uh, Inspector Tom Chesley, and, and everybody who's just put in a lot of efforts in their branches to really take uh, very proactive steps in, in addressing the gang violence that used to be quite prevalent in our community. Um, and as you can see in 2017 and 18, uh, the numbers. Uh, what they reflect. So we know that uh, this is something we can never uh, lose sight of, and it is a priority for us, as you'll see, uh, moving forward with our strategic goals in 2022. 
Our violent crime rate, one thing I'm very proud to report again is we do have the, the lowest violent crime rate of all our neighboring communities uh, in Fraser Valley here. Uh, as you see, uh, we went down 7% for violent crime in 2021. Uh, so the number there reflects 10.8 uh, incidents per 1,000 population. Um, as you can see, um, some other communities around us went up. Uh, some communities went down quite significantly, but they still have a higher number per thousand. So, um, we, when we say, you know, make an atmosphere the safest city in Columbia, that is something I can promise you is, is very alive and well in all our conversations and something we take great pride in, in making sure we are uh, the safest community uh, in British Columbia. And I, I think these numbers in part reflect that. One thing I just want to bring to everyone's attention is, you know, a, a trend that we've seen that continues to increase, it's incredibly troubling for us, but assault by, uh, against a police officer. Uh, last year, we had 29, the year previous, 32. I should note that 29 doesn't just reflect, in some cases, it was two police officers that were um, assaulted in one incident. That would be counted as one. So the number is actually more than 29 police officers. But, you know, every day, um, you know, our police officers are putting them in very, themselves in very difficult positions. Uh, you know, just two days ago, I read another call of a, a police officers being spat at uh, while they're trying to uh, assist a person who is going through a mental health crisis. Uh, and these are very challenging calls for everybody. There's a lot of scrutiny on our members, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, incredibly proud of their professionalism and how they handle themselves and, uh, in managing these very difficult uh, and tense situations. So. But I think it's an important thing for us to continue to monitor because it is uh, something we're seeing not only in Abbotsford, but certainly in all communities. When we're talking about violent crime, one of the areas I want to talk about was robberies. Uh, last year, we were up 22% from the year previous. So in 20, uh, 2020, we had 85. 2021, we had uh, 104. But just to give some perspective of what this represents, so 27% of those robberies, uh, or 27% were shoplifting uh, files where violence uh, escalated when the person was confronted. So for example, threatening the uh, store uh, detective or threatening uh, staff as they were trying to intervene. So that's obviously very concerning for us, but it, it is a real trend again uh, through communities in the lower mainland. The other one is uh, with uh, street associates. And, and a lot of times that's impacting our marginalized community. Uh, with sort of street level type robberies. Our street outreach response team, Inspector Burroughs and, and the team, his, his work of his teams are trying to address that, support people in the street. One of the things I will say that may be a contributor is the fact that we have built these relationships with our marginalized community. And in fact, are having more people report some of the street level robberies because patrol uh, sort, our street outreach response team are actually reaching out to the community, going into the camps and talking to people and they, they are more open to now um, telling us their stories and, and what has happened. So uh, as you'll see, we did have five bank robberies, a uh, couple, uh, three gas stations and uh, 11 uh, were at a store or a restaurant. So sexual assaults, uh, again, up 9% from last year. Uh, one thing that, you know, really is a trend, many of them are historical sexual assaults. Many of them are sexual assaults that involve a relationship uh, uh, that is either uh, a new relationship or an ongoing relationship. Um, one thing, again, like intimate partner violence, this is a number that we actually don't mind in a way seeing going up because it reflects in some cases people being more comfortable in reporting incidents that are occurring. One of our biggest concerns with intimate partner violence, sexual assaults, is, is the unreported files that are occurring. So there really isn't a lot of trends that, uh, that we've identified in, in order to proactively disrupt. But one thing, and, and Deputy Crosby Jones has been working hard on too, is you know with the study, just finding what some of the barriers are for reporting uh, these types of crimes, and and trying to make sure that we can enhance uh, people's comfort level and ability to, to reach out and want to get help and, and make those reports. So, and finally, just for violent crime, I'll just speak briefly to assaults level two and three. Um, they're up. 3% from last year, uh, really a, a, a you know, nominal amount from the year previous. But again, you know, we're seeing a lot of these are kind of those low, the street level type uh, incidents that we're occurring uh, into a partner violence, uh, you know, forms part of that. So 
Uh, just to give you a reflection, though, from 2017 uh, over the five-year period, that we are seeing uh, the increases in violence uh, or the street-level violence. But that is also in part two reflective of, you know, the, the bigger size of our community and some of the other challenges that we're facing. Property crime rates. So we stayed static uh, from the year previous. Uh, we went, uh, we had no increase or decrease. Uh, you'll see many other communities actually did have a decrease, but it, once again, uh, our number of 33.3 uh, uh, per 1,000 does still reflect the lowest number of all our neighboring communities. Uh, so that's something, again, we're very proud of. We're still going to be uh, working very hard to continue to get that number down uh, and, and try to, um, to find some different proactive tools that we can use. Just to talk about uh, some property crime, uh, break and enters. This is a number that I think we have put a lot of effort into, we're proud of, to see that we're down uh, consistently over the last uh, three years in break and enters. And we know break and enters have a significant impact on our community, certainly commercial and residential, that uh, a sense of community safety when someone's home or someone's business is broken into. Using the intelligence-led policing, certainly for commercial, um, you know, doing heat maps out of Inspector Chesley and Sergeant Mike Hannonen's uh, area of control. Uh, you know, every week we're identifying where these are occurring, identifying our prolific, super prolific offenders that are causing the most concern for us. And um, Inspector Doug Bohr in the Crime Reduction Unit, I can tell you, just does an absolutely amazing job of identifying who our most prolific offenders are, targeting them, and uh, and arresting them in many cases in the act and getting uh, and getting them held into custody, which is really important. Theft from auto, uh, this is a number that I will tell you, I think, or sorry, this is theft of auto. Uh, you know, again, we're seeing the number uh, go down significantly. This is a high number when you compare it to some of the other jurisdictions more to our west, in part because we don't have transit, unlike, you know, SkyTrain and other uh, tools that people can use more to uh, our western regions. So this represents, as you can tell, well over a, a vehicle a day. Um, what's problematic for us, though, too, is, you know, these vehicles are often used for other crimes or, or crimes such as break and enter. We often have many incidents of uh, failing to stop for police when we attempt to do a traffic stop, which poses a great risk to the public. Um, but again, it's something that we're working very closely and, and we'll continue to focus on moving forward in 2022. 20, uh, that from auto, I will say that I would argue that this is a number that is probably impacted by um, a person's inability to make a police report. Um, 1,400 or you know, almost 1,500 last year is not a true reflection, in my opinion, of how many theft from models really occur. Um, many people do not report this crime, or if they try to, um, as we know, some of the concerns with ECOM will uh, will give up. I had my car broken into when I was on the island about three months ago, and, and I actually reported it online. And it was uh, fairly simple, but it was important because it gave that local police department the ability to know where there might be a pocket of thefts. And that's why, again, you know, Director Lane Klassen and, and you know, uh, Paul Walker, getting that message out to our community that we want to know about these uh, incidents. So, um, so I think this one is truly reflected by, you know, um, it's often very unreported in our community. You heard me talk just briefly a second ago about failed stops. Um, so again, this continues to be, you know, weekly event plus for us. Um, of course, we are very cognizant of the fact that these can be very dangerous to our community and our public. Uh, so 124 last year where our police officers attempted to pull over a vehicle and it fled. As you know, we are um, bound by provincial legislation, but very mindful of the risks when these vehicles flee. So we don't engage in a pursuit. We do have some tools that we can utilize, uh, whether through air services, through spike belts that we can deploy. And in many cases, you know, with good police work and being, you know, covert, we've been able to uh, still stop vehicles. But, uh, but it is a very alarming uh, stat to see how significantly these have gone up. And I can tell you, too, I'm also working with the BC Association of Chiefs of Police Traffic Committee to see if we can find, through the provincial government, more effective tools and penalties uh, for persons who do fail to stop for the police. Um, we would like to see longer impounds much more significant fines, uh, which currently don't exist. And finally, uh, violation tickets. Um, as you can see, we're down about 1,000 from the, the year previous and, and uh, a couple thousand from uh, 2019. Um, you know, certainly um, many of our other priorities 
last year uh, impacted this. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm still you know, proud of the significant effort that's gone in by patrol, by traffic, uh, and all our members to really focus on those uh, behaviors that are most uh, impactful to public safety. Last year, we had 10 people draw, uh, die as a result of a motor vehicle incident. That's up from three the previous year. That is a, a horrific number. It, it's, it saddens us. And this is, once again, going to be a real focus of us to just focus on those most dangerous areas where people are driving. The other one is um, for us to just bring your attention. We're going to, you'll see um, Constable Paul Walker doing some more media campaigns. Uh, is just in regards to impaired driving. And just to give you uh, um, some background on that, in 2020, uh, total combined uh, for Adams Police Department of offenses we put forward, and this is all the different criminal code um, prohibitions that we dealt with for impaired driving and drug impaired driving was 558. And last year, the total combined was 778. So up 220 files. Um, I think it also really highlights, you know, just the effort that our members are putting into ridding our streets of impaired drivers and drug impaired drivers. So really proud of that. Um, several of the new exempt members that we've hired are, are very passionate about this. Our traffic unit all pride themselves on making it to Alexis based on the number of impaired cases they put forward. So please stay tuned. Please watch. We have a series of videos that have been going out recently too, talking about this. And, uh, and uh, this is a number we definitely are, are very troubled by and are going to work very hard to, uh, to address. And with that, sir, uh, that's uh, the update from last year. And I just thank everyone on the team. And uh, we're open for questions. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation and to staff as well. Uh, questions of the Chief? Colette. Colette, I see that. I think that was Colette. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. I was really interested to note that on a number of those graphs, there seemed to be a peak in the 2017, 2018 years. And I'm wondering, um, uh, Chief, if you could go back to the two slides that, that, that are back to back around street checks and homicides, because I was interested to note that I think 2017 was really a peak for homicides and 2018 was a peak for street checks, if I'm remembering it correctly, but they came in sequence. Is yeah, there a connection between those two? Could you show those two slides again and explain if there's some kind of connection? Because street checks were really, really high in that one year. And did that relate to gang like investigation or what was what was that all about? Yeah, so absolutely good observation that we uh, we did see a real increase in, in homicides. So if you can just go back one, please, Donna. Homicides in 2017. And obviously 2018, a large majority of those homicides are, um, you know, as you saw back then, 10 of them were gang related. Street checks, you know, bluntly are a valuable tool when, uh, when applied, you know, appropriately and provide, you know, our teams with the intelligence of, of who's connecting and who's meeting. Uh, as these wars were going on, um, those street checks were certainly um, increased in an effort for us to, you know, identify who, uh, was connecting with, with each other where we needed to focus our intelligence-led policing on and things like that. So, um, you know, it, it, so I, it's actually very interesting for a lot of us to see that, you know, I've had uh, less homicides and certainly less homicides that there's a nexus to gangs, despite the fact that we only had 10 street checks. Now, we still do other types of checks. Uh, you know, there's checks where we're, you know, we have the lawful authority to stop someone in a traffic stop and it's a traffic stop versus a street check that we still can get that intelligence and, and it helps us to, again, better understand, um, you know, some of the connections. But, uh, but yeah, you, your observation, I would suggest is correct. In light of what we were dealing with in 17 and 18, we certainly put a more concerted effort into really identifying the players. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mandy, uh, Mandy I think, yeah, is that Mandy? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I don't have a question. I want to make a comment. Um, I wanted to uh, just acknowledge um, what Chief Sear had said. I was out in the community yesterday and um, I heard a very nice comment uh, regarding the members of APD with their interactions with the homeless commun uh, community and uh, people that were suffering um, in the opiate crisis. And the comment was that um, the members were very caring uh, very diligent in trying to accommodate um, this, these people that they had had contact in and getting them um, the proper resources. 
And um, it was made from um, a pharmacist that deals consistently with this population and sees many, many people. And this is the comment that he made to me um, regarding the APD and its members. So I was quite proud to hear that and very, very um, appreciative of the members. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I always say we have the best police department in the province. So that just adds to that. Uh, anyone else? Don't see any other hands. I do have one question. I'm just uh, wondering on uh, on the calls for service. I think it was 10,000. I couldn't catch the numbers, but I, I'm wondering if it would be helpful to the board to break that number down once a year, like in this yearly update, to see what kind of service or what what is what makes up those service calls. Because if there's a trend, uh, well, the board could address that and say, does this concern us? or not. Uh, is that difficult to do or? Yeah, I'm going to pass it over to you in one second, Elaine, to speak to you. Elaine's our expert in this area. But but just to say, you know, what's interesting is, you know, we're looking at as a department, what percentage of these calls actually should not come to the police? They could actually be directed. And that's part of why I'm asking too, is exactly. because if, because it's, I, I say this to the fire department, uh, you know, they have 10,000 calls for service, but only 300 and some uh, and I don't mean this in a, in a negative term, but only 300 and some are actual fires. Yeah. Uh, the rest are other things, and especially uh, with the opioid crisis uh, overdose uh, response, uh, it would be nice to know how much, I, I'm expecting huge swings in some area, because it would help me then advocate with the province and saying, you guys got to put more money into the ambulance service or other services, uh, but just when I see just one big number, then uh, I'm not sure what that's telling me. Yeah, so, and then the other thing I can say is, for example, for a drug overdose call, we would not get called. That's actually a policy of, of ECOM that uh, that goes directly to EHS. In the past, we used to get those calls. Not every one of those calls would require a police response. Some of those can be um, a police officer who is on a modified duties can respond to some of those calls and can support or, or ECOM will address it. But um, Elaine, can I turn it over to you to make some comments? Yeah, and I, I'm only thinking of broad categories. I'm not looking for a spreadsheet yeah. with 500 line items. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be hard to pull out. Um, we do, um, it goes by uniform crime reporting, and so we can pull it out, but it would be really broad, Mayor, because a lot of our files would fall under the category of assist general public or assist police fire or police uh, ambulance or, or fire. So it, it would be quite broad. We do tend to go to a lot of what we would call assist calls that may not um, result in any sort of um, report to Crown Council or any charge approval process. Um, we really get called for lots of stuff. So um, what we could, it wouldn't be hard. It would just be, it would generally be quite broad. Actually, you brought up an interesting point, which is a pet peeve of mine is uh, charge, you know, the number of files that go to Crown Council and how, how many of those actually lead to a charge. Because uh, if that's like uh, one tenth, that actually reinforces what I've been saying to the, the attorney general. <laughs> so when I, I'm looking for some ammunition here. Well, I know we sent you that report that uh, Inspector Chesley and his team put together on prolific and super prolific offenders, yeah. and we can certainly build on that because that is one of um, you know, Constable Walker and I have, have tried to push some of that out on social media that we are frustrated that. You know, we're getting these prolific offenders, most recently one with 12 catalytic converters, yeah. who once again, you know, is, is just causing havoc in our communities. And we need these people held in custody and, uh, and to buy us some time you know, and hopefully let them learn a bit of a lesson. But, yeah, surely. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Don't see any other hands. So that takes us then. Uh, so thank you, Chief, for your report or for your year end review. And that takes us to the Chief's report. Yeah, so uh, it seems like a long time since I've been able to update everybody, and I'm really happy a lot of the team, uh, senior management team, could be here today on the call. And and uh, I'm Paul Walker, and I just want to start off by just speaking about the flood and uh, and really the reason we canceled our November meeting. But uh, so on November 14th, we all saw you know live on TV the heavy rains that hit our community, and and on the 15th we really saw the impact of the floods on our entire community, and. Um, I have to tell you that I could not be, and as you say, the best police department, uh, sir, I have to tell you that I absolutely 
uh, truly echo that. I cannot be prouder of the women and men of this department. Everybody you see on this call, um, you know, everybody um, 300 strong are professional uh, civilians and our, our members who just absolutely went over and above during that real two week period when everyone was on fumes, when people were, you know, I can tell you stories of police officers who themselves were impacted by the floods, who had themselves lost homes or their families were having uh, troubles with the floods in their homes that were out there uh, on that Monday night, keeping the community safe, you know, uh, taking off their duty belt and going into heavy waters, contaminated waters to rescue people. People work in, you know, 40 hour days who are on fumes, but wouldn't go home until we absolutely forced them to go home. You know, uh, and so many others who just put in extra hours or adjusted their shifts at last moment to who were working in different units who came to help and support patrol and the efforts that we had. Not only that, but also to thank all of the other police departments and agencies who stepped up and supported us when we needed them most. I mean, we saw over and over again, just anything we needed, we were given. Uh, and that was spectacular. Your senior management team, Constable Walker of Media, I can tell you every one of them uh, just did a unbelievable job, whether it was in the emergency operations center, uh, you know, managing, you know, um, critical infrastructure and other things that we need. Logistics was a nightmare. We had a vast majority of our members who were trapped in Chilliwack that we were trying to bring in to work and to get them home to their families. Uh, so there was just so many moving parts. So all that to say, is, uh, you know, it's in your most difficult and challenging times that you really see true character and true leadership. And uh, I saw that over and over and over again. Could not be prouder. And maybe also just to say, uh, sir, that to you, uh, your leadership uh, meant the world to us as a department. Uh, you stood up there uh, proud and gave everyone confidence. And uh, I could not be prouder to have had the opportunity to work with you in a very difficult situation. Your, your leadership was absolutely spectacular. So I thank you. And Thank you, and I'll pass that on to the rest of our staff. But I echo the chief's comments um, uh, regarding uh, the whole department. And I mean, I could write a book about this, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I will, uh, but not while I'm the mayor. <laughs> but uh, but I do want to give a special shout out to the chief and to Constable Paul Walker, who assisted me greatly uh, during that time. Uh, without you, you two, I would not have been able to do some of the things that I was able to do. So thank you for that as well. Thank you, sir. And uh, maybe that's just a good segue to uh, just introduce the board to uh, Constable Paul Walker. I know you saw a lot of them. Yes. We have a bad habit of when someone becomes our new uh, media information officer, public information officer, that they come into a crisis. And Paul's literally first day was the Monday of the floods and, uh, and he did a outstanding job. And uh, so to the mayor's point, so welcome. You'll be seeing a lot of Paul and Paul will provide reports on our media. Uh, the other one is a, is a bit of a tough one for me to bring up, but I, I just have to say that uh, I'm happy and sad at the same time that uh, Deputy Paulette Friel has uh, decided to move on into her next chapter of her life. And after 38 years, she'll be retiring on April 30th. Uh, Paulette has, like I said, uh, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail now. There'll be time for that later, but I, I can tell you 38 years, four and a half years with Abby PD. Uh, you know, 33 years, you know, with the RCMP. And if just to everyone remembers, Pollock joined our department early when John Davidson was murdered. Um, she was supposed to join a couple weeks later, but she couldn't sit on the sidelines. She was there on day one and uh, she walked with us on an incredible journey and uh, supported our staff. And she continued to do that for her entire career. And uh, she will absolutely be missed uh, and the value she brought. So I just want to let everybody know that uh, we're Going to be saying goodbye to Paulette in about three months. So, um, just a, another one I'll bring up, just a couple of real quick ones. Just recruiting, Paulette did provide a, in the consent agenda just a, a brief overview of our recruiting uh, that has been done to date. Um, her and her team, Trish Lowe and her team, Director Lowe, uh, they have knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, we talked to this board about concerns with Surrey Police Service and, and losing people. That has not happened to the level that we thought it might. Um, I think to date, and Director Lowe, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's nine people that we've lost to Flurry over, over quite a span of time. So, um, so we really weren't impacted yet as much as we thought. But uh, our recruiting section in 2021 hired 24 members. I think that has got to be a record for the amount of people hired. That just, it, it was an enormous task to hire that many people. Just real briefly, as you saw, 14 were exempt. So from other police departments, we're very fortunate, brought a wealth of experience 
uh, to our department that we're very fortunate to have received, and 10 were recruits. Um, of those 24 members, 22% of them were represent our diverse community, which we're very happy bringing new language skills uh, to our team that we're, we really um, value. And 25% were female uh, recruits. So again, just uh, speaking to you know the diversity that uh, we're very fortunate we we get to our department. So uh, right now in 2022, we just have uh, we have four recruits currently in the Justice Institute right now. Uh, so that'll be about 10 months before they're out. And we have three recruits who are finishing what we call the block two where they're on the road doing their mentoring and they will be graduating from the Justice Institute on March 4th and uh, joining our team. So uh, lots happening and uh, Trish or Paulette, I don't know if you want to add anything, but I know you have, uh, you're trying to get four or five more for the May class if I'm not mistaken, so. Yeah, thanks Chief. We're uh, actually gonna have uh, 14 recruits at the JI in the coming year. We've got six slated to go for May and maybe another six to eight again in September. So it'll be a busy year with new recruits as well as uh, trying to increase our exempt numbers as well. We'll stay busy. Thanks Paulette. Yeah, we just, we just right now we're in a busy time with, uh, we're seeing projecting for a lot of retirements. Uh, and uh, so it's a good opportunity for people. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. And maybe just the last one, I'll just give a real brief update just because I think it's a, a real interesting kind of stats, but we have a tool and I'll pass it over to Brett called the Automatic License Plate Reader and really try to reinvigorate that as a, as a tool to try to identify when you saw some of our traffic stats, some of our most problematic uh, drivers. So Brett, I'll just turn this one over to you. Yes, uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, we have two of these vehicles in patrol, and in the third quarter, we took on a third vehicle in the traffic division. What they do is they're uh, they're able to drive around and automatically read license plates to uh, so it just prevents a member from doing it while they're driving. So, just brief stats in the year uh, combined, those three vehicles we checked two hundred sixty four thousand vehicles, which is incredible. Um, in that time, uh, uh, dealt with twenty eight prohibited drivers that were identified by doing these vehicle checks and served 21 driving suspensions. Of note with that vehicle, those vehicles, what we're able to do is during the flood, uh, when we're patrolling in the areas where the flood zones were, uh, our members deployed with those vehicles, they could check all vehicles in and around those areas to make sure we uh, saw who was coming and going in those areas. So it's a great tool and it's something that's out on patrol and in traffic all the time. And that's my report, sir, if there's any questions. Certainly. Well, maybe just pick up on the, <clears throat> the license plate reader at Sumas uh, Prairie during the flood. Um, I heard a number of media outlets use the word looting out there. There was, re there was no looting out there, was there? Or was there? Yeah, I, you know, it, it's, looting is kind of a, for me, brings a different connotation. Yes. We did have some break and enters. We had some thefts. Of, uh, some of the thefts that were reported were actually, you know, property that had floated. It was on the side of the road and, and it was gone the next day. And so whether you know, or categorized as, as a theft. We did have some legitimate break and enter. Yes. And uh, what I can tell you is our um, crime reduction unit, the surveillance team, uh, did an absolutely spectacular job in identifying uh, who we believe is responsible for a majority of those uh, break and enters. And Brad, I don't know if you wanna, I'll let you finish the story, but uh, they, they did an outstanding job. Yes, uh, thanks Chief. We actually uh, had some partnership with uh, Chilock RCP working with this. Uh, patrol division, uh, canine, uh, and crew did an amazing job in working on several files. One of which, uh, which uh, particularly touched one of our members, a sergeant, one of our traffic sergeants. So, files still ongoing, um, charges before the court. So, it was a really good, uh, cohesive, and teamwork investigation from patrol right through uh, to crew, including with the assistance of a uh, Chilwak RCMP. So, it was a it was a great thing in that a lot of members of our department obviously bought in because it uh, hit home for us. And maybe Brett or, or uh, Paul or, or Doug, if you remind me, I think it was, it worked out to 16 break and enters we had during that flood period in, this, in the Sumatz Flats area. But can, can either of you correct me on that number? So just, just for everyone, it was, it was approximately 16. We, uh, we had put out extra resources um, people driving through and up and down that area, which is typically an area we don't police uh, you know, significantly. We don't, there's not a lot of calls in that area, but certainly during the flood, we made sure that our community who was out there, who was vulnerable, who weren't in their homes, uh, that we did everything we could to get uh, staffing and vehicles out there proactively, visually, um, trying to be a deterrent. So, so 
but I just thought it would be helpful for the board because there was terms being thrown around that I thought, nah, that's B and E. Yeah. Uh, I did have a number of calls. Um, sorry, Chris, I see that hand. I'll come to you in a sec. I did see a number, or I did have a number of calls from people who said, you know, somebody kicked my door in, uh, but didn't look like they stole anything. And I said, that probably was search and rescue, making sure that there was nobody trapped in the house. Oh, they said that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, and that's what happened. Yeah, right? and that's what happened too. So, Chris, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just around the automatic license plate reader, what's the record retention policy or process around that? So thanks, Chris. Good question. Uh, do you know that right offhand? I don't. I could follow up and get back to you on that unless, uh, I don't know if Paul Walker is more familiar with that than I am. I can answer that But, now. but I, I, I sorry, as I think about it, Chris, I think, and I'll turn over to you, Paul, we don't actually retain the records. It actually just, it, it runs a plate. It pops up if the person, if there's any prohib driver, any restrictions on that license plate, uh, whether it's a crime vehicle or anything like that. And then it's, it's essentially gone. It's not that we, we keep every license plate that we run and, and you know, reference back to that data. Um, but Paul, certainly jump in. Yeah, I can add to that, Chief. Uh, as far as like the Chief mentioned, all the uh, hits that are the scanning that takes place in the day is purged at the end of the day uh, electronically when we do the upload back to the eDivision server. Uh, anything that we had a hit on that we action, such as a prohib driver or warrant arrest, uh, that data is sent to EDIV as well. I believe it's retained for two years and then purged. Uh, uh, APD here, we don't control any of that data. It's done by the RCMP and we're at arm's length from that. Good. Thank you. Any follow up? Good. Any other hands? I didn't see any other hands. Paulette. Oh, sorry. Paulette. Colette, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Braun. I just wanted to follow a bit of a follow up on that break and enter situation during the flooding and the, the nuance of language around the word looting. And from my perspective, looting is a, it's not a formal criminal justice term, but it's something the public uses when there is a, some kind of state of emergency or a crisis is happening. And then a, a bad actor exploits that for personal gain and goes into places and steals. They take advantage of the instability of that moment of that crisis and exploit that for the purpose of theft and, and robbery and all the rest of it. And I think as the department goes on to consider um, emergency planning, like in the case of an earthquake, if we had more flooding, if we had forest fires, anytime you're evacuating people, then this risk arises. So technically on the books, yeah, it's break and enter, but it's kind of nuanced because you can have people with a criminal mindset that exploit a crisis for personal gain. And I think that's why the word looting pops up. So I'm just curious to know uh, what um, D Deputy Culbertson or the chief might think about that. Dan, you wanna go first? Sure, uh, thanks for the question there, Colette. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, crimes of opportunity specific to the flood were definitely a concern for both the public and the management team um, when we address that. Um, you know, we did deploy, we had a, a pretty robust strategy of addressing uh, crimes of opportunity, specifically out in the flood. We had uh, dedicated patrols of that. We had property crime out there. Uh, you make a good point about the nuances of the terminology. Although I think, uh, and Paul can add to that if he chooses to do so, but it was quite a uh, quite a strong media message about one, about the crime that was occurring out there and two, the police response spe specific to the flood area. So I think the police department overall was aware of that and we tried to deploy resources and have a media strategy that would uh, address all of those concerns. And maybe call it just as, so we were very mindful of the term looting. By definition, it would fall, as you say, into, it's a correct term, looting. But, but the reality is I think a lot of people take the, the term looting and the connotation of what we see in an urban environment where you know, there's been a, a riot or there's been a major unrest and people are smashing into businesses. So for us, we wanted to provide the context that, that really painted a clear picture. We didn't want to build this beyond what we felt it was. This was people, as you said, taking advantage of people not being home, taking advantage of, and let's be blunt, anyone who is doing this, um, I have, you know, that is as low as it gets when, it, when people have been so impacted by the floods and you have people that are taking advantage of that, but I'll try to keep my comments uh, sane on that. But we, we, but Paul did a very good job in the media of really directing that what we were dealing with. Some things were theft, 
Some, some things were some break and enters um, and really focusing on what we were dealing with and keeping the community understanding that this wasn't a, a, a you know, band of roving groups who were going around looting. It was, it was some individuals who were taking the clear advantage of the situation. Thank you. I appreciate, I was just going to respond to that. I appreciate that because you're absolutely right. Like I'm thinking of the Canuck riots and, you know, the playoff riots and other kinds of situations where you have a high degree of urban, there's an urban piece around that. And I think, you know, the crimes of opportunity language is probably more helpful here. And I can understand why you wanted to keep the, the concept of looting really isn't necessarily the right fit. Mm -hmm. Doug, Doug, did you have a comment? Yeah, thanks, Chief. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I tried to get on back there a little while ago for the 16 uh, charges. So I think we did submit 16. I don't know how many uh, Crown went with, but we certainly, you know, we have four people that are in custody and from reviewing and providing oversight from the command post and going through all those files, there's no question. They definitely meant the benchmark of intent of beating a break and enter. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other hands? Questions? I don't see any. Okay, thank you, Chief, uh, for that. That takes us to our next item, which is uh, Arja update. And that goes to Mark, but I don't think Mark's on the call yet. He has not joined yet. He hasn't joined, so we may have to pick that up later. Okay. Or we'll do it, uh, well, if, if it's not at the end of this meeting, then it'll be in the next meeting. Yeah, and also the next agenda item as well. Yes, I just saw that. So he's on the next two. So that takes us to Ecom update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've got a, a just a very brief update for open and then I've got some more elaborate uh, discussion for closed. Um, so uh, since we met last, um, I believe it was October, um, there was a lot of discussion in the media in regards to BCEHS and their, uh, their call answer delays, um, some of their staffing issues in regards to dispatching ambulance, um, ambulances and ambulance attendants to various calls. And so what was happening at ECOM is that operators uh, would have to stay on the line until that call was picked up by the dispatch center for BCEHS, which was resulting in huge, huge uh, call delays and tying up 911 lines. Um, so this put a huge strain on, on emergency communications all over the province, not just in regards to uh, uh, ambulance, but uh, when a 911 line is tied up, then that impacts fire, police, uh, and non-emergency. And so, um, the decision was made, I think November, uh, coming and rolling out in December um, to cold transfer calls to BCHS. And so what would happen is Ecom would do a little bit more uh, triaging of the calls and the more urgent stuff would get prioritized with, uh, with ambulance. Uh, but if it was a pretty straightforward ambulance call, it would be cold transferred uh, to the dispatch center at BCHS which would then open up 911 lines for other callers and would also open up non-emergency lines. So um, that put a huge strain on uh, emergency communications just in general. And as a result of that, uh, huge call waits, uh, frustrated people, uh, people hanging up. Uh, non-emergency was basically non-existent uh, over that period of time because there wasn't enough uh, capacity to answer all of the calls that were coming into 911 or into the Ecom Dispatch Center. So, um, that's a little bit of context about what was going on and then you would have heard in the media um, some discussions uh, from the union and rebuttals around um, the chronic understaffing of ECOM and um, then some also some discussions from the ambulance side of things where they're concerned about staffing levels at the dispatch center and with uh, people on the road. So um, with that, um, there's been some improvements to uh, I guess service standards at ECOM is the way to put it. And so, uh, well, it's not exactly within the promised service standards, it's much better than it was in the fourth quarter of 2021. Good, thank you, Mike. Any questions of Mike? His verbal report, I don't see any hands. All right, that takes us to our uh, standing uh, committee reports. Uh, first up is finance, so over to you, Mike. Uh, nothing to report at this meeting. Okay, thank you. And governance and policy is uh, Mark, but he's not on the call, so we'll have to pick that up later. Um, HR, uh, Human Resources Committee, Chris, anything for us? Nothing to report at this time, no. Thank you. 
That takes us to other business. I don't have any, which then takes us to questions from the public related to today's agenda. Uh, Mr. Flavel, anything for us this morning or this afternoon now? A, a, a cheerful farewell to Paulette and, and a joyous welcome to Colette. Uh, Colette uh, used to try and train me years ago when she was in Arja. And so I'm delighted to see her here. She'll be a great asset to the board, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So did she uh, succeed in training you? <laughs> I think you'd be the judge of that, sir. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Good to see you, Aaron. Uh, I wish it was in person, but anyways, that's the world we live in. Uh, our next board meeting is Wednesday, February 23. And that uh, takes us to the end of our meeting. And uh, I'll let the members of the public uh, disconnect. Well, I guess everybody has to reconnect. Everybody they have to disconnect and then reconnect for the closed meeting. So it'll take a couple of three minutes. And just for the uh, my team, I know you're all busy.